So uh, I'm going to be talking about how a bee detects your colony size. Uh, and my name is Michael, and thank you so much for introducing me. And, uh, and yeah, I hope I don't let you guys down. Um, so uh, OK, here we go. So you know, you're all used to seeing bees all the time. These are bees in an observation hive. And, and I work with a lot of observation hives. And what really interests me about bees as a biologist, but also as a beekeeper, is how individuals are gathering information about their colony, about what's going on in their colony, and what they need to do as an individual as part of a larger group. So we can think of, you know, you're this one little bee. You can only get information about your immediate surroundings. And, and how are you learning about your colony? Because different things happen at different times. And the thing that I'm, I'm most interested in, at least for my PhD, was a special thing that's happening here. And there are bees that are building comb. And you can see some nice uh, some gals. They're going to be pulling the wax from underneath their abdomen. They'll be masticating it. And they'll be depositing it here at this leading edge. And eventually, if my cueing is correct, there'll be a bee that's going to come in from the top left to, oh, here she is. All right, so she's got a little bit of wax here, and this is where she'll be building. But unfortunately, she's got ADHD, and she's going to go build somewhere else. Uh, which, I mean, that's fine. That's not my, you know, I'm not in charge here. Uh, but, but what I'm really interested in is, is this comb building process and how they're detecting uh, the need to build comb, but then also, very importantly, what type of comb to build. Uh, so you're all beekeepers, I hope. Um, and if you're a beekeeper, then you're very aware that there is work, uh, laser, whatever. Uh, there's two types of comb. That's ah, okay. I can just point at it. I'm tall enough. Uh, <laughs> you have worker comb and you have drone comb, and these two types of comb are different sizes, which is nice as a biologist because it means that I can very quickly distinguish two types of comb that the bees are building. Is this worker comb? Is this drone comb? And the kind of the key crux uh, of what I was working on is how are those bees? those individuals that are moving around their colony, how are they detecting the moment at which, OK, I'm a bee. I'm going to be building some comb. But it's time for my colony to start building drone comb. And that's a very important transition for a colony because it really marks a, a whole colony level shift. So from worker comb to drone comb. And I'm interested in how she knows that it's, it's time to do that. Uh, so just in case you're a stickler, and it's OK if you're a stickler, uh, I don't know if you're aware of anthropomorphizing. Um, throughout this talk, I may like, say things like, like, if I were a bee and I'm walking through, uh, just to calm you, like, I don't actually think I'm a bee. That's OK. Uh, we're friends. So, so if, you know, if, if I do some anthropomorphizing, please you know, take it with a little grain of salt, and it should be OK. And you know, I, you know, I am aware of the dangers of anthropomorphizing, but at the same time, you know, it's, gosh, it can be a drag knock, too. Uh, so so that's, where, that's my little like, kind of warning slide. Um, so, so one of the reasons biologically that I'm interested in drone comb is, is drone comb is a very special moment in a colony's life. So if you think of any and all uh, organisms, you know, whether it's a plant, a human, a bee colony, uh, you have resources and you invest them into different uh, investment strategies. So you can invest things in survival, you can invest resources in growth, and you can invest things in reproduction. And the, the thing that's important about drone comb is that a colony that's gone from just investing in survival and growth has transitioned into investing also in reproduction. And so drone comb is that very first moment of deciding that this colony is ready for some reproduction. Uh, and in the case of honeybee reproduction, you actually have two forms of reproduction. So you have swarms that can be cast, here shown on the left. So here's a swarm of bees on a nice apple tree. And here is a drone. Honeybee colonies are actually hermaphrodites because they can actually produce both male and female reproductives. But in the case of these, these are fully functional, ready to go reproductives. This drone is a fully mature drone, ready to mate. So that's like, that's like in that pie chart, that's like you've already got a big chunk of reproduction. You're actually fully investing in reproduction. What I'm interested in is actually like the little tiniest sliver when you're just beginning to invest in reproduction. It's not reproduction now, it's reproduction in the future. Uh, and, and well, Part of why I like this photo of this swarm is actually you may notice a second form of reproduction on this, this image. Um, there are some apples in the back there. So that tree is also investing in reproduction. That's also a fully formed reproductive unit for that tree. Uh, but it's also personally important to me because when I started my PhD, I actually planted this tree. And uh, once it started fruiting, I knew that it was time I had to leave. Uh, so if you're doing a PhD, plant a tree. And when it fruits, get, get out of there. Uh, so. If I haven't drilled this into your head enough, and I, I really hope, because this is kind of important for the whole thing, is that 
we may look at drone comb as kind of like a, eh, God, drone comb kind of thing. But for me as a biologist, drone comb is interesting because it's the very first reproductive investment. And when you think of a colony as a whole organism, it's kind of like puberty. The colony's not reproducing yet, but they're just beginning to start shunting those resources towards future reproduction. And that's why, that's kind of like the, that's the biology behind it. Uh, so, obviously I work with honeybees. There's lots of people that have done lots of work, and I'd like to make sure that, you know, I'm kind of keeping up with that stuff. Uh, and so, we knew from a while ago um, that larger colonies build more drone comb, and they do so sooner. So if you're a larger colony, you're gonna start making that switch sooner and you're gonna make more of it. And this was a work done by Juliana Rangel and Tom Seeley, published in 2012. And what we have here is on the y-axis, we have drone comb, so the amount of drone comb built. On the x-axis, we have time, and we have three different sized colonies that were started from swarms. And you can see that the largest colonies, they build the most drone comb, and they also build it the soonest. So those large colonies are making the switch the soonest. But as beekeepers, we all know that large colonies and small colonies are different in many, many, many ways. In fact, actually, large colonies and small colonies are different in every single way you can imagine. Large colonies have more workers. They also have more worker comb. They also have more brood in that worker comb. And they also have more honey stored in that worker comb. So, when you compare large colonies and small colonies, you're literally, like, everything is different about those two. So the real question is, how does that worker know, hey, I'm in a large colony versus, hey, I'm in a small colony? Because remember, the large colonies are producing drone comb, the small colonies are not. So what kind of cue are they using to detect that, yes, it's time for my colony to make that switch? So right here, we're going to follow another bee. And, you know, if you're anthropomorphizing, please, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, but we have this bee right here, and she's got some wax scales underneath her. And we can imagine her, and she's walking around. Okay, is my colony ready for drone comb? What am I looking for? Am I, you know, am I looking at the number of other workers here? Ah, gosh, wow, we've got a lot of worker brood in here. Maybe it's time for some drone brood. Like, man, I've been walking all day long. I've been seeing all this worker comb. I haven't seen any drone comb. Or, wow, we have a ton of honey stores. We have so much honey, we can definitely start investing in, in some drone comb. So that's, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about that gal, and I'm thinking about how she's detecting information that her colony is, is ready for puberty. Uh, so because I'm a scientist, I like to throw out hypotheses and then kind of gather data to kind of, kind of shoot them out of the water or kind of prove myself wrong. Uh, so, so with this information that we already had, we kind of came up with four different hypotheses. And the idea was that there's some cue in the colony that they're using to detect that they can afford, like, you know, afford, like a financial kind of afford to invest in drone comp. And that could be something like worker number. So here's your worker with her wax scales, and she's somehow detecting the number of other workers in her colony. Maybe it has to do with comb area. You know, you've got a lot of worker comb. They're building a lot of worker comb. She's walking, walking, walking. She's saying, wow, there's so much worker comb here, no drone comb. Maybe it's time to start building some drone comb. It could also have to do with actually what's in the comb. So it could be that she's not just taking account of the worker comb in there, but the brood that's in there. So it could be some kind of a brood factor. Once you have enough brood, then you know that you can start making a transition. And it could also have to be with honey. So you can see, you know, she's down here, she's inspecting cells. Maybe there, there's something in there. Uh, it could also be a combination. It could be actually two things at the same time. But at least for now, we'll just try to limit them to just one. Uh, so in order to kind of to kind of get at this, uh, I'm a big fan of doing experiments where you actually just let the bees tell you what they'll do. And so we needed to design an experiment where we can actually just increase one of those things while keeping everything else exactly the same. So you just want to change one thing at a time. And uh, I'll, I'll walk through this figure slowly because it's, it's a little bit funky. So, so what you got is each one of these boxes represents a colony. And each colony has a feeder on top of it so they all have the same amount of nectar that can come in because we don't want some colonies to have a lot of nectar and some to not have much. And some of the colonies have 5,500 bees, and some of the colonies have 12,000 bees. So, for example, in this one, we've just changed the number of workers. And each of these colonies has four frames. There's one frame of brood, just to make sure that they have some brood in the colony, that they're actually having some new bees emerging. There's one frame that's just an empty frame of wood that we can let them build some comb to let us know what kind of comb they want to build. And then the outer two frames are things that we change uh, for our experimental manipulations. So if you think of this as like a reference, like your control, in this one, the only thing that we've changed is the number of workers. We've increased the number of workers to say, okay, 
If we increase the number of workers, do we get more, more drone comb? Or if we take this one and we compare it to the comb area one, we say, okay, if we give you extra empty comb, so just worker comb, no drone comb in there, just, but just more comb area, does that make you switch over to drone comb? And then if we use this as a control, we can say, okay, well, what if we give you a little extra brood or what if we give you some extra honey? Which of these things will kind of induce this colony uh, to build more drone comb? Uh, does, this, does this kind of make sense? Is this, okay, I'm getting some nods. No one's, no one's crying. That's good. Uh, so when we actually collect these data, and I'll show you the, the data, what they actually look like next, we find that, oh, oh wait, oh yeah, I'm gonna show you how this actually looks. Uh, so I guess I didn't tell you this, maybe you can't see it. There's actually 11 colonies per treatment group. Uh, there's, not just, there's not just five colonies, so it's actually 55 colonies, uh, which is a lot of sweat. Uh, but you know, I'm young, so you know, I, I'll figure it out. Uh, so what this actually looks like is how we actually control the number of workers that go in each of these colonies. So we actually make artificial swarms. So each one of these boxes uh, actually has a single, quone, uh, single queen. Uh, they're, they're all from the same supplier, so they're all the same queens. Uh, we have workers that we source from our source colonies. We weigh them out so we actually know that, okay, this colony has 5,500, this one has 12,000. So we take these, we make artificial swarms, we feed them for a couple days. Uh, and then the, where the magic comes for me is I take these colonies, so here would be like an example colony, and I put in that frame and I say, okay, girls, I'm going to come back in about a week and I'm going to see what you guys have done. And then they will build comb on that nice uh, frame because, you know, they're, they're nice and I'm, I'm, I'm happy they do that. And I can just take this and I can say, okay, I'm going to measure this and I'm going to say, okay, they've built this much comb and how much of that is drone comb? And that's how they can tell me, Michael, we're ready for drone comb or eh, not yet. We need to kind of hold back on these things. Uh, cool. So that's all makes sense, I hope. Uh, and I can tell you that we had great evidence that when you increase the number of workers, you get more drone comb, a higher proportion of drone comb built, and that these things had no effect whatsoever. There was no difference at all in any of those cases. If we had more comb, more worker comb, more honey, more brood, nada, nada, nada. Uh, but if you're, you know, the, the, astute, the astute person might say, well, Michael, you know, maybe this number and this number are just so far apart that these girls over here with 5,500, they just had no choice, they had no chance at all to actually build any drone comb. So what if you actually did both? You've, you actually increase the worker to all to this point and then do the same experiment where you repeat it again. Uh, so again, because I'm younger, I can kind of do that, you know, because I got time to spare. Uh, so actually, so you can also increase all those colonies to 12,000 and then you can see subsequently, is there a change if they all have 12,000 bees? Now do they make a little more? Now do they make a little more if they got brood or is it because of the honey? Uh, and I'll show you the actual data next, but I can tell you that they were all exactly the same. There was no difference if we added extra worker comb, if we actually added extra brood, if we added extra honey, they all built the same amount of drone comb. It was all about the number of workers. So this is what the actual data look like. So on this axis, we have the proportion of drone comb. We use a proportion because we want to actually account for the amount of comb that they build, because of course, if you have more bees, they build more comb overall. And on the x-axis, we have the final colony size, which was actually the size of the colony at the end of the experiment, because we don't actually want to be messing with them too much. We just me uh, measure them at the end. And what we can see is that you have a, kind of a situation where you have, they don't build any drone comb, don't build any, and then there's a kind of a transition where they start building drone comb, and the proportion of drone comb increases. And that has to do with the number of workers in the colony. Uh, so, so this, at least you know, to us, it was like, okay, this is good evidence that there's something about the number of workers in the colony, and when that number of workers increases, they can now invest in this drone comb. They can go through puberty. Uh, so, so now, you know, in science, you always end up with another question. And now the question is, wow, okay, how does a bee know how many other bees are in her colony? We know that they react differently based on whether there's a lot of workers or few workers. How is she actually detecting the number of other, other individuals that are in her nest? And so this is, you know, this is what really, it's like, okay, that's what really keeps me up at night. Uh, how does she do that? Um, and I don't necessarily have an answer to that yet, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, so at this point, I'd like you to kind of take a moment to think about this, and, and how do you detect group size? How do you detect the number of people that are over at dinner, or the number of people that are at a party, or the number of people that are in this room? We do it all the time, but we don't think about it. So let's say, you know, at the National Honey Show, you, you could think of different ways you might detect colony size or, or number of, of individuals. Maybe it has to do with how hard it is to find a seat or how far back you have to sit. And if you're at the very back, feel free to come closer because, you know, it's fine. Uh, 
So maybe it has to do with that. How hard is it to find a seat? Maybe it has to do with that you do different things in larger groups. You know, maybe you have trouble hearing yourself think. Maybe uh, you, know, you, you, you behaviorally change. You do different tasks in your nest. Um, maybe it's something physiological. Maybe you have trouble finding a bathroom uh, only when there's a large, large group. Maybe it's something that, that's changing there. Or one of my, my favorites, it's, it's a big thing at parties and big groups is, you know, you find someone, you're like, oh, hey, I haven't seen you in so long. Let's chat. Let's catch up. And then you turn around to get a drink, and you turn around, and the person's gone, and you'll never see them again. And that's because you're in such a large group that you just get lost all the time. But, but what I'm trying to get at here is that there's lots of ways that we could be detecting group size, but we don't necessarily if that's what we're doing. But, so I'm just trying to get you guys thinking about this kind of stuff. So how might a bee detect your colony size? Um, and uh, you know, you guys, any ideas? Because I'm just an academic. Substance. Maybe queen substance. Temperature. Maybe temperature. How crowded, How crowded you feel? You, it, I, I kind of put this in the spaghetti in the spaghetti category. You can get a lot of spaghetti. You throw it at the wall, and then you kind of see what sticks. Uh, and you can have all kinds of cues. You can have visual cues, auditory cues, physical cues, chemical, behavioral, nest environment, all these different cues. Uh, but no matter what the cue is, uh, you, you really need to have two things. Whatever the cue is, you really expect it to reliably change with colony size. So if the cue is temperature, for example, we'd expect small colonies to be one temperature, large colonies to be a different temperature. It should be reliably different. And then the second thing that you want to do in an ideal scenario is you want to take that cue that was very, very reliable and you want to manipulate it. You want to kind of turn it up or turn it down so that you have a small colony that's, that has the cues that represent a larger colony and the other way around. Does that make sense? You're kind of making them, you're kind of like tricking the bees into thinking they're in a larger or smaller colony than they actually are. Uh, and at this point, if you're thinking I'm a little crazy, that's OK. I, you know, I, I don't have to make honey, so you know, I, I can do these kinds of things. Uh, so the plan of attack is first to actually look at the cue and see if it changes, and then manipulate the cue and see if they respond as if they were in a larger colony than they actually are. Uh, cool. So I, you know, I guess we'll go with that. So I'm going to start with actually the observational side, actually where we look at colonies and we actually measure those cues and see how things change. And the way that works is basically it's a, it's a pretty simple scenario. We have observation hives. These are four frame, large observation hives. And they're identical inside. They all have some honey, some brood, some empty comb, and a place to build some comb. Uh, they're free to explore the outside. They're free foraging colonies. The only thing that's different is we have small colonies that start out with 5,000 bees. And we have large colonies that have 10,000 bees. And then we can take all those spaghetti things that we think could be important. And we can just say, OK, are they reliably different between the large colonies and the small colonies? Uh, so in that case, we, so again, we come up with some hypotheses, different things that we think maybe are different. Uh, and I actually, I don't have enough time to go through all of these, but I can just give you some of the summaries and we'll go through a couple so you can get an idea of, of what actually the data we're looking at is. So you can think of like the fast life hypothesis. Okay, so this is like a behavioral difference. So imagine you're a bee in a small colony or a large colony. Do you live a different life? Do you have to rush from task to task? Do you have, do you perhaps uh, transition from early stage to late stage life more quickly? Is there something different about the behaviors that you're engaging in the colony, if you're in a large colony or a small colony? And I can tell you that we looked at a lot of behaviors. We looked at a lot of bees. Uh, and there's really not very, there's almost no evidence that there's any kind of behavioral difference. So for example, that you know, you know, in large colonies, you start foraging sooner. Or in small colonies, you spend more time um, you know, sleeping. I mean, there were some things to do with walking speed, but it, it really, there was not much evidence in there. Another thing that we looked at was movement and location. So you can imagine you're a bee and you're moving through your colony. If it's a very crowded colony, maybe you have to constantly turn and you're kind of like, you can't go fast because there's so many other bees in your way and you're kind of switching and all that kind of stuff. And I can tell you that on this side, so this is a bee and these are all the different angles that she turns throughout her, her day. And one of them is a small colony and one of them is a large colony and there's a difference of one degree. So I can give you a pretty solid evidence that there's no difference in how they're moving or where they're located in the nest. There's, there's not good evidence there either. Um, the next one we're going to talk about, though, is density and contact. And we'll go through those, these, these, uh, this bit a, little bit a little bit more in detail. Uh, so, so what I'm looking at now is I'm thinking about how does the density change in the colony and how are contact rates changing in the colony. And so the way we do this is we've got our small colony and our large colony, and we draw an imaginary line 
across the combs. And we then measure, so we take images, we then measure how many bees, if you were to move from this side to this side, how many bees would you touch? So how is the density changing? And we also do measurements where we take tagged individuals, young ones and older ones, and we actually follow them for 30 seconds and we look at how many times does she contact other bees, as in you know, how many times is she touched or touched by other bees. And we repeat this in small colonies and large colonies. Uh, we also, you know, even within contact rate, we're also interested, you know, maybe it has something to do with antenation. You know, maybe you're contacting lots of bees, but you're also antenating a lot. Maybe that has something to do with it. Um, so for, for contact rates, what we can show is for, at least for density, we can show that as you would expect, I mean, this really was not surprising, was that in larger colonies, you have more bees. So the density increases in larger colonies. But what was interesting was that the core density, so the density that you see in the middle, in the core of the nest, doesn't actually change that much. So whether you're in a small colony or in a large colony, that central area of the nest tends to have about the same number of bees. What's different, though, is that as you move towards the edges of the nest, you, have, you continually have a lot of bees if you're in a large colony. Versus if you're in a small colony, you have this area of high density but as you move out to the periphery, you end up getting lower and lower density as you move around. Does that make sense? So if we were to think of this as like almost like a mountain, in this one, we have a very steep mountain, as in there's high density and low density, and there's a lot of variation between the two. Whereas over here, you've kind of got like a plateau, where it's kind of like all high density everywhere you go. I can also tell you that the contact rates change. So the number of times bees are basically hitting up against each other changes in large colonies. If you're in a large colony, you're contacting more bees over a given amount of time. But you're not antenating any differently. There's not that there's more antenations. The antenation rate doesn't change at all. Uh, so, so, so in that case, we've got some good evidence here that maybe a case of density is changing, contact rates are changing. Maybe there has something to do in there. Maybe that's what we're looking for. Uh, and then also temperature was something else. So we have these uh, data loggers in the colony. They're measuring the temperature. And so what we'll see here is these are the, the days that we've followed these colonies. And this is the different temperatures. And we've got the four frames in the colony. So either it's capped honey, capped brood, empty comb, or the empty frame. And when we look at the core, so these different colors represent the different colonies, the core temperature, so the temperature in the broodness in the middle of the colony, it, it doesn't change in small colonies and large colonies. However, when you move out to the edges, you have more variation in smaller colonies. If you're in a large colony, similar temperature everywhere. If you're in a small colony, you have more temperature variation at the edges. Uh, so in that case, we kind of have, you know, we have a little, you know, no change in the middle, but some changes at the edge. Um, so when we think of all these different observational things that we can look at and we can compare between large and small colonies, we have a lot of things we can throw out, which is nice, because then I don't have to do another experiment on them. And we have a couple things that we say, okay, these are things that we'd like to follow up with. So especially density and colony temperature. So if I, if I summarize these, just in case, you know, just so this definitely uh, drills in, is that we were looking for these cues that reliably change with colony size. For the method, we actually went in and we had colonies of different sizes and we just measured those cues to see how they change. And the results was that we have some physical cues that change, density, contact rate, but not turning angles or speed or max velocity. Uh, and then we also know that temperature changes at the periphery. So it's like a, a variable environment. Uh, and so now, of course, we want to actually manipulate these things. Uh, so now we're going to switch to actually an experimental study. So what we're going to say is, OK, these are the cues that we found good evidence that they actually change. Let's actually go in there and kind of dial up the knobs to kind of change things in the colony to make them kind of think they're in a larger or smaller colony. Uh, so for that, you know, based on the information we had before, we went with density, volatile pheromones, and temperature. These are the things that we're going to actually manipulate. Uh, and it, you, if you're wondering, like, my, Michael, you didn't actually show that the volatile pheromones change in small colonies. That is true. At the time, we didn't actually have, uh, we worked with someone else to actually get some other things done. But at the time, it was like, you know what, this is something that would probably make sense. We should probably do it, even if we don't have the other information yet. Uh, so, I, you know, come on, I'm not a saint. Uh, I mean, you know, come on, you know, it seems like, okay, we'll just, we'll throw it, it's spaghetti, we'll throw it at a wall. Um, so, so transitioning now to an experimental study, and what this calls, it's a, a split hive design, where we have these colonies that we're going to look at their comb building, but we're going to change those cues in the colony to see how they do. And so again, these are the actual colonies out in the field, 
We have the colony that we're looking at, and they have a modified entrance here so they can come in and out. And then they've got a feeder up here so everyone has the same access to nectar flow. And then we have down here is the box where we do things in this box to change the environment up here. But the bees can't move between the two. They just have this is where we can do things, and this is what it's going to change up there. Uh, and again, I, I work with a lot of colonies, which means a lot of sweat. But you know, hey, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, so we want to increase these. We want to actually dial up the knobs. We want to increase these different cues in these colonies. So one of the things we want to do is we want to increase density. And so the way we do that is uh, a very high-tech method. Uh, we have this is our colony that we're focused on. And we take a large wooden block, and we put it in the colony. So we've now increased the density. And these are very expensive. You cannot find these in, uh, at the stores. They're very, uh, it's a lot of money that goes in there. Uh, so that's one thing. So we've now increased the density. We basically squeeze the bees into a smaller space. Uh, another thing we want to do is we want to increase the volatile pheromones. So what we've done in this case is this is the colony that we're, we're interested in. And they've got an entrance that's going that way. So they're actually, uh, they're, the bees are coming out that way. But we put a second colony in below. And their entrance is going this way. And we have holes. So they have shared airflow, but no shared. There's screens on either side of that entrance. So the air can circulate between the two. Uh, so the volatile pheromones can circulate between the two. But it's not that the bees are switching between the two. And we also make sure that at the end of the experiment, we actually measure the colony size to make sure that these bees weren't ending up in here. And we're also measuring the temperature because you could say, well, you now got a, heat, a hot colony in here that's maybe heating the one up there. So we, we make sure that the temperature isn't changing either. Uh, and then, of course, the last one is we want to increase heat. And this is another very high-tech method. You take a, a light bulb and you cover it in tinfoil. Uh, and it's got to be a 40-watt light bulb because if you use a 120-watt light bulb, you'll end up melting the colony up above. Uh, so uh, yeah, you know, the tax dollars at work. Um, so for this one, we actually increase the temperature by having that light bulb covered in tinfoil underneath. We don't actually want the light in there. And uh, we actually, you know, we do controls before and to make sure that it's heating up the colony enough, but it's not overheating the colony. Uh, and the idea is that if you're in one of these temperature treatments, you've got an increased temperature, but uh, it's not so hot that it's kind of burning you to death or anything like that. Uh, I, just to kind of give a little actually, the, the idea here is that if you're in a small colony, maybe you spend all your time trying to raise your temperature. And if you're in a large colony, maybe you spend all your time trying to cool your colony. Do you see like, how that, that might be a difference between the two? Uh, so what, is actually, what do the actual results look like? So of course, we have a control where we haven't actually changed anything. And then we have the, different, the density in treatment, the pheromone, and the temperature. And we've got the proportion of drone come over here. And only increased density changed the proportion of drone comb that was built in these colonies. So it was only density. Pheromone, temperature, no difference. And, and to be honest, I really kind of, I thought pheromone was, I thought that was going to do something, temperature as well. But it, it turns out that just squeezing those bees into a smaller space, they kind of, uh, they switched and they built more drone comb. So we're here. We know that if you increase the density, you can increase the proportion of drone comb built. So now we've kind of narrowed it down. So we thought first, OK, it's worker number. How are they detecting worker number? Has something to do with density? So now, of course, because you're a scientist, now you have another question. How are they actually detecting density? It's kind of a never-ending story. Uh, and, and remember that I also was talking about contact rate. So contact rate and density were both things that were changing. And we're interested in, OK, you know, can we separate these two things out? So, so what we have at this point is we know that bees in large colonies, they're experiencing a higher density and higher contact rate than our bees in small colonies. So there's two different things that are changing. And if we experimentally increase the density, we can induce these workers to build more drone comb than they will in those control colonies. But density and contact rate are actually different things. They're related, but they're different. Uh, and so you know, in an ideal world, we could actually like, pull those things apart and kind of actually understand one in isolation of the other. Is it the little the density of workers, or is it actually how much contact is happening between those workers that's uh, letting them know that they're in a large colony? So here's some chocolate chip cookies. I don't know why. Uh, so if you think of a chocolate chip cookie, how might you detect the density of chocolate chips in a chocolate chip cookie? There's actually lots of different ways you could do that. So, you might do something like you might actually just look at these and say, OK, this one's got fewer than this one. So you might actually be looking and you might be saying, OK, this is how many chocolate chips are in there. Or I might be able to blindfold you, and then you can eat them. And you can be like, OK, this one's much more chocolatey than this one. So for a given bite, I have this much chocolate. Maybe that's how. 
Um, maybe you're kind of like a, maybe you're a bit of a weirdo and you take the chocolate chip cookie and you break it apart and you then, you know, just actually count up all the chocolate chips and then you've ruined your cookie. But I mean, you know, I don't know, that's, that's what you want to do. Uh, or maybe, you know, maybe you, you take your fingers and you run your fingers along this and every time you feel like a little bump, you're like, okay, there's a chocolate chip, there's a chocolate chip, there's a chocolate chip. And then given a the size, how many chocolate chips have I detected? Um, I live a bit of a weird life. I, you know, that's, I, I don't, you know, I don't expect you guys, I mean, I don't, I, yeah, maybe this is a little weird. Uh, so, okay, but the, the idea is that there could be visual cues, taste cues, touch cues, maybe you're counting, uh, and that you're, you have all these different types of information that you might be collecting to then say, okay, what's the density of chocolate chips in this chocolate chip cookie like? Um, so to kind of, to really uh, drill down this point, I actually made this, is that, um, what I want you to also understand is that the way bees move changes the way that density and contact rate can change in a colony. These two things are related, but they're not the same. So to illustrate this, we have, we have low density cases. So imagine this is a box and we've got three bees that are represented by circles versus we have a high density situation where we have three, four, six, seven bees. So in this situation, we have low density and low contact rate. And over here, we have high density and low contact rate. Because if the bees don't move, their contact rate doesn't change at all. But if we actually take into account the movement of bees, so here, oh, they're touching here, they touch over here, and okay, there's another touching over here. We have to factor in both the movement and the number of bees to actually know how density versus contact rate changes. So what I'm saying is that you have low density in both of these cases, but in one case, you have low contact rate versus this one, you have high contact rate, which contrasts with this situation where you can have high density and low contact rate versus high density and high contact rate. Um, I know this is, uh, yeah, I mean, the crux of it is that like, bees move in their colonies and that movement changes things like contact rate even if you have a, a uniform uh, density. So the good news is, uh, at least the good news for me, is that for the most part, density and contact rate are pretty well correlated. For every increase you have in density, you also have increases in contact rate. And the reason I know that is if you actually take density, so this is the number of bees in a four by four grid, and you do this over many, many times, you measure many, many colonies. As you increase the density in that grid, you also increase the contact rate over 30 seconds. And so it's a pretty, it's a pretty uniform relationship. So, so the two actually can, you know, at least in the back of an envelope kind of case, you can actually kind of, the two are pretty well connected. But again, as a scientist, I actually want to try to pull these things apart and actually see how they, how they might uh, be influencing uh, a colony. Uh, so how are we actually going to manipulate this? Well, we can manipulate one without also changing the other. We want to increase contact rate without increasing density or the other way around. Um, and actually, I struggled with this for a long time, and I'm, I'm still tr struggling with this. Uh, but what I, came out, what I came out with, and this is definitely, there's, there's more that could be done and should be done and maybe should not be done. Uh, what I came up with is, is Dr. Smith's touching machine. Um, and, you know, uh, Previously, this was Mr. Smith's touching machine, which is actually a lot weirder. Uh, but now that I'm a doctor, it's Dr. Smith's touching machine, so you know, it's, a little, it's a little less weird. Uh, I, related to that, please don't, don't call me doctor. It, like, just Michael is, like, you know, I, I, you know, it's, believe me, I ain't a doctor. Uh, especially if you got a heart attack. Um, so, so what does Dr., Dr. Smith's touching machine look like? And I, this is not a joke. Uh, so what it looks like is you have these sticks here and it's, it's actually contact paper uh, that's been cut into these strips and then cut very, 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 uh, very lightly. And so what it looks like is you have these sticks and they have these pieces that are actually like, so there's like almost like little fingers, right? And then so you take that and you stick it on these Arduino setups and you can actually have them rotate at a specific speed. So you can have them kind of moving at a slight rate. And so, so if you're thinking I'm a weirdo at this point, you're now, you're really gonna think I'm a weirdo. <laughs> So you take that observation high, right? You drill a hole through the glass, which is a great way to buy more glass if you're not very good at drilling holes in glass. <laughs> and you, you take the touching machine and you put it on the inside of that glass and you can rotate it. Uh, and you're actually kind of lightly tickling, lightly, a light tickle on the bees. Uh, so of course I'm gonna have a video on this. This is actually what a touching machine looks like. Uh, you saw it first here. Um, you know, uh, I'm glad I'm in science, because I don't know if I'd really be able to do it in the business world. Uh, 
So, so this is actually what it looks like. So you actually have an observation of here, and you have this, these, this thing is actually passing over and, and lightly touching the bees. And I can I'll show you a little closer up what that looks like. Of course, you, you need a control. So what does your control look like? It's, it's the same thing, but it's just the sticks. So, so you've got the sticks moving through. So you have all the disturbance, but you don't have the tickling. And the tickling is what's important. Uh, you, you might also notice that these sticks are actually a little bit shorter. Um, the, the reason they're shorter is when you have really long sticks in the colony and they're moving around, what you end up happening, happening is the bees will climb onto the sticks. And then as you get more bees on the sticks, the thing slows and slows and slows. <laughs> and then eventually, you get to the point where there's so many bees on the stick that it stops. Uh, and then I'm like, oh shoot, it stopped. I should turn up the power a little bit. So I turn up the power a little bit, and then bees fall off. And then <laughs> as they fall off, the thing goes faster. And then you basically have a, you, you, you know, um, if, if there's such thing as bee hell, I'm, I'm headed there directly. Uh, so so that, that's, actually, that's actually, so there is a control. There, there's also an additional control where we actually just do nothing to the bees, and those bees are the luckiest ones of the group. Uh, so these all start with the same number of bees, and now we're just, so. Uh, no, these actually were, so what we actually, for, so she, she asked if this is a large hive or a small hive. So what we're actually doing in this case is, in the case where we had, 10,000 versus 5,000, we're trying to compare a large colony with a small colony. In this case, what we do is we take a small colony, and then we either give them a control tickler or a test tickler, and we see if we can so change. Yeah, so I think it depended. You know, we tried a different, couple different colony sizes, and we also measured the colony size of different ones. It ranged between you know, anything as low as 3,000 up to 6,000. But the idea is uh, whether they have uh, the control tickler or the actual touching tickler, if that will induce them to build drone comb sooner. If that, does that, does that make sense, everyone? I'm not doing this just for jokes. I mean, <laughs> this is my career. Um, okay, so, uh, so, this actually, so this is actually the tickler in action. You can actually see there's a queen under there. They actually, I mean, I, I was actually surprised at how well this does work. I mean, I was almost embarrassed for the bees. It's like, wow, you're really just continuing your day like this. Uh, and if you kind of like focus on the side of here, you can actually see that they're, they're lightly tickling and touching the bees. And there's actually, there's a queen underneath there that's actually laying eggs. So, so really, I mean, it, um, and we actually quantify that, that, you know, that it's actually tickling bees. And yes, you have some bees that kind of go like a, a carousel on it, but it's, it's a bit of a weird scenario. Uh, and so, of course, because you, you can't just do this with one-on-one, -on -one, we actually have this shed where we have, uh, so this side you see four, there's actually eight colonies all being tested at the same time, three of them, uh, with the ticklers, three of them with the controls, and two of them with a control control, which basically has nothing. Uh, and so, so I have to tell you that, that these data are actually in progress. I'm actually working on writing this up right now, so I can't actually show you the data that has been generated. But, I can, but what I can tell you is this. I'm not going to be on the cover of Science or Nature magazine anytime soon. <laughs> um, because, because basically what happened was it's, you know, we did actually have these bees building comb but they were all building worker comb. There was no effect of having the tickler in that colony or not. So, uh, so you know, that, that's a bummer for me because then, you know, I don't know, I'd be rich and famous or something. Uh, but, but there was no effect of this tickler. And, and I'm the very first one to say that there's lots of, of difficulties with this. You know, we might not be tickling the bees correctly. There's obviously a lot of weird things going on in here. Uh, but, you know, so sometimes you just have to do the experiment, and you have to say, okay, you know, is this going to work? Would this work? If it worked, what would we know about it? And, and what I can say is that we have a very solid negative result in that if you tickle your bees, you're not going to get more drone comb. <laughs> but in the wider scheme of things, it's probably good that we tried. Uh, so so that's, that's where we are. So you, so you might be thinking at this point, like, oh, Michael, you haven't really given us a satisfying story. Because you, you told us, OK, you know, density is important, contact rate's important, but you know, maybe not, because if you tickle them, it doesn't change things. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, you know, that's, that's kind of the way science works. You know, we kind of move along things, and we'll see what comes up next. Um, but, but if you can take something away from this, there's, there's a couple things that I think should be important, or at least I, I hope you will, will come across. And that is, the, the first one is, is that Drone comb is, is like colony-level puberty. Uh, so that you know, when you look at that drone comb in the colony, what you're really looking at is the very first sign that that colony is now investing resources in reproduction. The other thing that, would be, that you know, I hope you would take home from this is that the workers somehow know, and I put that in quotation because you know, we don't know that they know, but they respond differently based if they're on a small colony or a large colony. They have some way of detecting the number of other individuals in their nest. 
and so, so we know that they know, but we don't know how they know. We know that density is something that they use to detect the size of their colony, but we're not sure how they actually detect that density. So, and, and that's the evidence that if we squeeze them into a smaller shape, we have, we know that larger colonies have higher density. We know that if you squeeze them into a smaller space, they have higher density, but we don't know what cues they're using to detect their density, which they would then use to detect potentially their colony size. Uh, and we know that drone comb is the earliest reproductive investment, and that we know that these things have to do with these early reproductive investments, but we don't, this, this is just for drone comb. It, it may also be the same case for swarming. Uh, you know, my gut feeling is that maybe these same cues that they use to detect when to build drone comb would also be similar cues that they use to detect that their colony is large enough to swarm. But again, that requires future study, and it's actually something that I'm really interested in doing uh, later, later in my career, because I think that'd be a really cool thing to, to kind of deal with. Um, so yeah, so you know, hey, another day. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to thank a lot of different people. Uh, Tom Seeley was a PI in the lab, and he, he literally let me do whatever I wanted to do, which is maybe obvious. Uh, we also had a lot of really great uh, uh, assistants in the lab. Phoebe and Maddie were, were really great. Uh, people that helped with statistics, other people that helped with assistants, other graduate students. Uh, Heather Madela, of course, at Wellesley. Uh, a lot of this work was funded by the National Science Foundation at Cornell, the Garden Club of America. There were a lot of people that, that you know, put money on the line for this kind of stuff. And it is inexpensive work, but it's not free work. And as a graduate student, that's really important. Uh, I'd also like to, a special thanks to the Surrey Beekeepers Association for sponsoring this, and also for you guys actually putting up with this talk, because I know that it's not necessarily what you're probably interested in at 9.30 in the morning. Um, and yeah, I mean, with that, I, I, I purposely like to leave a good bit of chunk of time for questions, and we can discuss things, because, you know, I, I don't have all the answers, and maybe you guys do. Uh, so yeah, I'll take questions. Uh. Was your tickling machine mimicking bees bumping into each other? And if so, how do you know they could, they could recognize the difference? Yeah, so I so guess, so the question was, how was my, my tickling machine actually mimicking uh, the touching? So it was basically just the idea that when you look at bees touching each other, a lot of times they're not actually responding too much to it. It's basically just like a light touch of bees. If you also think of bees as being in multiple parallel combs, you have a lot of, every bee that you see in an observation hive normally would have another bee on, on her back. So that's the kind of like the light touching. But you know, the critique of like, you know, how much touching is enough touching? How fast should you have it go? These are all, um, when, I was, when I was working with this, this tickling machine, I, I definitely, I, I titrate it so that I don't want them to be getting touched so much that it's disturbing the colony and that the queen's not laying, the workers have abandoned the comb and they're all going to the, per to the edges. So you need to touch them lightly, but not so lightly you're not doing anything. Did you, I, I saw a talk by Tom Seeley where they looked at bees making a noise when they got touched. Yeah. Did you think about using the noise as a stimulator? Or? Yeah, so the question was noise as a stimulator. Uh, that'd, be, that'd be super cool. So, um, so the work that Tom's done is often about signals, and signals versus cues is signals is for something specific versus cue is like, you know, just like a general, like kind of a, like an, you can think of it like an ambiance versus like a direct message. I don't have any evidence that there's like a direct signal. It's not like, like you know, they're not like doing stop signals to say, hey, it's time for drone comb. Um, what I can say though, is that uh, in a separate set of experiments that I didn't, I, I didn't show here, we actually measured vibrations in the comb. So you can think, you know, you squeeze those bees, you're changing a lot of things. Maybe it's just that there's a vibration in the comb. As you increase the number of bees on the comb, uh, counterintuitively, actually the vibrations are dampened there's actually less vibration on combs where you have more bees. So if you think of it this way, so imagine you've got all these hexagons. What we think is going on is that each bee is basically acting like a staple that's connecting lots of these hexagons and therefore damping those vibrations. So the, the actual relationship would be that in large colonies, you have less vibrations. In small colonies, you have more vibrations. However, when we measure the amount of vibration that changes, the amount is so small that we don't think that they could actually use it as a reliable cue of colony size. Um, and the reason we know about how the, the combs are vibrating, at least theoretically, is that when bees are doing waggle dances, they vibrate the comb. And so if you think of like, okay, here's a noise level of vibration, and here's a waggle dance, you have a, a, a difference when there is this vibrating for, uh, for, the, for the waggle dance, and we don't see that amount of a difference. It's a much, much smaller difference. 
Does that, an does that answer your question? I'd just go way out of left field. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Another one over here, Michael. Yeah. I was just wondering about the external uh, or the environment, really, and the time of the, the month of the year that you did these tests in, and whether you just had to wait another year and keep doing it in April or May or June or. Yeah. So. So the question was about the time of year and how the time of year would affect these results. Um, so first off, it's, it's, it's pretty well established that time of year does also matter for, for building this drone comb. For that reason, all of my experiments, when I take a set of experimental control, controls and experiments, I do them all at the same time. And that's part of why I have to do 55 colonies all at once, because I don't want to say that, okay, these started in April, May, June, and July, because then they would also have to factor in the, the time of year. So, so my way around that is actually doing it all at the same time of year, but one could certainly do similar experiments to this and just change the time of year, and you would almost certainly get differences. Uh, that also, you know, for the touching, for the touching machine experiment, those experiments, you know, because we had to do a lot of troubleshooting of how to make them work. The experiments were actually conducted in July, August, so that might have been something that we actually, if we did it earlier, maybe we would have seen something. But uh, you know, at this point, the results were so negative as in just you know, flat line, just none across the board. I think if I were going to do that experiment again, I probably would come up with a different type of touching machine as well. Uh, but you know, that's, that's for another day. Yeah. Jim. So, sorry, what conclusions have you come to? Oof, what conclusions have ah, I come to? That? Well, OK, I, I mean, I've got to, let's see. Yeah? It's not satisfying. This is science. Yeah, this is this is horrible. I mean, yeah. So yeah, I know. There's like there's no end to the story. This is a horrible thing. Um, I, the end of the story. So at least at this stage, the end of the story is we know that they're con they're they're recognizing the number of workers in the nest, and we know the density has to do with that. So increased density that uh, they they now detecting their colony size is larger, but we don't know how they detect density. So, so I mean, the, the thing, I guess the... the so if, if you've got a large colony, they will definitely make drone comb earlier than the smaller colony. Yes, certainly. Right. Yeah. But you don't know why they do that. So uh, why in terms of why are larger colonies doing it? Yes. Or? Yes. So, so we would think that a larger colony will... In, so all colonies eventually want to invest in reproduction. It's a more of a question of, at least on my side, it's more of the question of when do you make that transition? Um, so, so in, in one case, so why would you make, why would you build drone comb? Because you need to invest in reproductives. You need, yeah. you need to build drone comb before you can make drones. Yeah. Um, the question I'm asking though is, is a little different. It's more that if you're an, indiv you're an individual bee in a colony, how are you detecting that your colony is capable of making that investment? And so we know that, that they're paying attention to the number of workers in the colony and that as the colony gets larger, the density increases. And if you increase the number of workers, or you increase the number of density, then you get workers starting to build this drone comb. Uh, and, and the reason I can say that the density, so the worker number was the first experiment where you can see the number of, as the number of workers increases, you get more, a higher proportion of drone comb. The experiment where I squeeze the colony into a smaller space, that they're all, they, they all have the same number of workers, but the ones with the higher density, they build drone comb sooner. So, so to stop your colony making a lot of drone comb, you give it more space. So, so your question was, to stop your colony making drone comb, give it more space? You know, personally, I like drone comb. So, you know, I mean, for me, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, give them a chance. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean. But it would stop it swarming early. I'll, I'll be, you know, regarding, you know, I know as beekeepers, we don't like drone comb, and I, you know, I understand that sentiment. Uh, but gosh, you know, like for the colony, they really want some drone comb. Why not just give them some drone comb? Uh, you, know, you know, so so yes. I'm quite fascinated by the role that drones play in hives, and I'm like you. I believe we should have drones in hives. It's, I mean, I've, I've worked for commercial beekeepers in England and in New Zealand, and they make a point of removing all drone comb from a hive they can. They'll go through frames, rip out ones before winter, with lots of drone comb in, and such like. Um, from this, I have two questions. Uh, one is, when do bees, what, what effect does, does drone, do drones and does drone comb play on the colony? And following on from this, when do bees know that they have enough drone comb? I mean, how, how, does, how does the drone slash drone comb signal to the bees to say, hang on, you've got lots of density, but we've got lots of drones, let's cut down that drone comb a bit. I'm gonna rephrase your question. So, 
just so I know that I'm understanding it, that how do the bees know that they have enough drone comb? So we know that it's a negative feedback control system. Uh, so this is work done by Stephen Pratt. And the, the idea is basically that, so you have your nest, and when they have a lot, the, the presence of drone comb suppresses additional drone comb building. So once a colony has a lot of drone comb, they won't build more. Uh, but you're also asking about how the presence of adult drones may suppress or induce drone comb building, and we don't have an answer to that. There's some, you know, people have made inklings that if you have a lot of drones, then maybe that decreases the number of drone comb. I, I don't know if I would entirely buy that argument, simply because the drones you have now, that's your current reproductive investment, but building drone comb is a permanent investment. It's an investment in basically the bee's home. Uh, so I'd, I'd recommend you come to the talk that's, I don't know when the talk, I don't know when it is, but there's a talk on seasonal drone comb and use and building, and, and I'll get a little more into that, that maybe, maybe that'll, that'll, that'll pique your interest. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, apart from your inferred benefit of your touching machine, I wondered whether there was actually a benefit of, a side benefit of it, for instance, that the, uh, it actually reduced the amount of varroa in the hives. Um, so we didn't, we didn't do anything to do with, we didn't measure varroa rates or like the infection rates or the amount of varroa falling. Um, you know, even if, even if I had seen, that, you know, it would have been cool if I had seen like a lot of varroa falling or something like that, I would not recommend, this would not be a, a good way to, to reduce varroa counts in a colony. I mean, you know, you know, we do know that things like, you know, the sugar roll does work and that has to do with actually like additional grooming, but I think there'd be much better ways to, to do that than, uh, than these, these kind of things, yeah. Uh, would've been cool, but, but I guess not, I, I don't think necessarily would be a, 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 a applicable commercial application at least in, in the context I'm thinking of. Uh, a lot of stuff we do in experiments is not suitable for, for, for common consumption. I would not, I'm a bad beekeeper in a lot of ways. Uh, not like a bad beekeeper, but you know, like a, like a weird beekeeper.